Hello everyone, um, my name is Adele and I head up the community team here at eSynergy Solutions. Welcome to our Kubernetes webinar with guest speaker Mandy Waite. This webinar has been sponsored by eSynergy Solutions. We specialize in open source and cloud resourcing. So if you are looking for a new contract or permanent opportunity, then please send over an updated copy of your CV. Should you be looking to build out your team and are currently hiring, eSynergy can help you overcome your resourcing challenges and we can provide your team with the opportunities to upskill through our events, webinars and subsidized training courses. So please get in touch with myself for further information. Moving on now for some housekeeping. If you have any questions for Mandy throughout the session, please enter them in by the chat box. Mandy will be answering these at the end of the talk. Um, the webinar is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording will be made available tomorrow and sent by email along with my contact details. So now I'm going to hand over to Mandy to begin and we hope you enjoy the session. Hi everyone, welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, thanks to Adele and ESNG for inviting me along to talk today. Uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, container orchestration using Kubernetes, uh, an introduction. And we're going to look at some uh, containers, we'll look at Docker, and we'll look at uh, what Kubernetes offers uh, when it comes to managing your containers. Uh, so we don't have the opportunity to do any polls today. Um, normally like to do some questions, but uh, I wonder how many of you are actually using containers today. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to bung them in the chat window. Uh, I'll try to get to, to them if they're important during the talk. If not, we'll answer them at the end. So to get started, uh, that's me, Mandy Waite. I work for Google. I'm a developer advocate uh, working specifically on the Google Cloud Platform. And you can find me on Google Plus at plus Mandy Waite and at TechGirl on Twitter. So, what's this? Uh, this is a data center. Uh, so this is a data center, uh, one of our data centers in the US, uh, in Iowa, in fact, a place called Council Bluffs, Iowa. Uh, and it's one of our larger data centers. Uh, and if I think I've left, left it up long enough, you can probably count all the machines in the racks. <laughs> so I won't leave it up for too long. But basically, this is what we call a cluster. Uh, it's a large cluster of machines, uh, and we subdivide clusters up into what we call cells. And cells could be uh, tens of thousands of machines. And the interesting thing we're going to look, talk about first is how do we make this computing power to, uh, available to all of our uh, engineers, all of our software developers? And then once we've looked at that, we can kind of start looking at how we're trying to make that possible for you to do uh, through Kubernetes. Uh, so yeah, so how do we make this uh, this data center, this processing power in this data center available to all of our software engineers? So one thing we don't want to do is uh, for the software engineers to have to worry about identifying a machine on which they want to run something. So uh, we don't want them to have to kind of think, uh, in this data center, in this rack, in this machine, I want to run this, and then SFTP over a binary, SSH into the machine, and then stand up their own server. And maybe do that multiple times as well, maybe to run uh, hundreds, thousands of copies of, of that same program. Uh, what we want them to do instead is to declaratively tell something within our uh, cell uh, what exactly they want to run. And so we have this kind of developer view of things. Uh, this is a configuration file, and it's a Borg configuration file. Some of you may have heard of Borg before. Uh, it's mentioned recently. We published a white paper on it uh, earlier this year and Borg is our cluster scheduler. So in order to access uh, Borg and to access all of that compute resource, our software engineers will create a config file, a Borg config file. And they start it like this, uh, job hello world equals. Next thing they do is identify which cell they would like to run it in. In this case, we're saying it's cell called IC, uh, which is meaningless to you, uh, but that's where they want to run it. Then they specify the path to the binary. Uh, in this case, it's called Hello World Web Server. So we're going to do the uh, 
data center equivalent of Hello World, effectively. And these binaries are fairly flat binaries. They're statically linked for the most part. Uh, and this one would also include its own web server. So uh, statically linked means that they have all of their dependencies built into the binary themselves and don't rely on the underlying runtime to link in uh, when the application or when the process is running. So these binaries will be, or this binary specifically, will be about 50 megabytes in size. Oops. And we can also specify some arguments. And so the arguments are things that the binary will need to run. In this case, uh, it's an environment variable called port. Uh, and we have this uh, parameterized. So we're going to pass in the port to the binary when we run it. Then requirements in terms of resource requirements. So we can say how much RAM uh, we should make a bit, uh, this uh, binary, this one in application wants, uh, how much disk it wants, and how much CPU it wants. And finally, we can specify how many copies of it we want to run, how many replicas. So this is the number of tasks within this job. And because this is Google, why well, say five? Let's say 10,000. Right, so we can have 10,000 copies of this. This is Google scale. Uh, and this is a configuration file, or at least a, a part of a configuration file that a developer would submit when they wanted to run a job. And what they do now is they uh, go to the command line, they uh, emit some commands, pass them in the configuration file, and it gets sent out to our uh, cluster scheduler called Borg, and this happens. So as we can see, after about 2 minutes 40 seconds, we have about 10,000 of these running tasks, 10,000 copies of this uh, uh, binary, uh, this job that we uh, specified within the configuration file. And we don't hurry up to get all these running. We gradually, gradually uh, increase the number that are running until we get to the right number, uh, approximately 10,000. Uh, it takes about 2 minutes 40 seconds, and you hit many considerations in this case, one of them being uh, data I.O., uh, throughput of the actual binary itself, because it's 50 megabytes, we want 10,000 copies. We're talking about probably about 20 gigabits per second of data being moved around within that time period. So ramping up slowly is really the only way to handle it, so we ramp up until we get to a point where we have roughly around 10,000 running. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the details of why it's roughly 10,000 today, uh, but uh, uh, maybe we can talk about that at some point uh, in another uh, webinar. So we have the 10,000 running. Uh, how does that all work? So again, within a cell, we have this thing called ball master, the ball master, which is uh, replicated uh, resilience. We have five copies of the ball master. So each cell would have their own ball masters. And down the bottom here, you can see the machines. Uh, each one, each of these machines will represent, or each of these boxes will represent a machine running in a rack. Uh, and each one of those has its own ballgit, something that actually controls what's running on that machine. So what happens is a binary is compiled. So we've already had the binary compiled, but in this case, we're going to use uh, our own distributed build system, parallel build system, uh, which is available open source now. Uh, it's available on GitHub as a project called Bazel, uh, which is called uh, spelled B A. Z E L, or sorry, B A Z E L, if you're British. <laughs> and ultimately, the binary is compiled, and we copy the binary over to some storage, uh, cell level storage uh, that's accessible to all of the machines within the cell. And then we push the config file, the config file gets pushed out to the board master, it's stored in a persistent store, which is a Paxos based store, uh, highly available. And then at some point, a scheduler comes along and looks at the state of the system, looks at the state of what the system should be, uh, and compares the two, and it determines that there should be 10,000 jobs running uh, that are not running, uh, so not 10,000 tasks running. And so it says, let me fix that, I will go ahead and fix that, and it creates a plan on how all of those 10,000 tasks will be run. And ultimately, the board master starts instructing each of the board bits to run the job. So the machines that have been selected to run these 10,000 will get an instruction from the board master to say run this job. And you can find the binary here. So each of the machines, the board on the machine will go and retrieve the actual binary itself from storage, uh, copy it over, and then start running it. And that's how it happens, and this is what we end up with. Lots of Hello Worlds running in our data center. So there's not quite 10,000 on that uh, screen, but uh, imagine what it would be like if it was. So somewhere in this cell, there are 10,000 uh, tasks running. 
So let's get away from what Google do. That's what we do internally and how it all works. And one of the key things about Kubernetes and what we're going to talk about later is trying to empower you to be able to do this yourself, uh, to be able to have the same kind of mechanisms and trying to scale and manage uh, complicated uh, applications and uh, architectures using a scheduler. Uh, so we're going to use for this a sample application. Uh, this is a simple guestbook application. Uh, we have a client uh, talking to multiple PHP front ends, and the PHP front ends will be communicating with MySQL at the back end and the memcache. Uh, so that's a very simple uh, uh, application configuration that many of you will be familiar with, probably a LAMP stack. And what we want to cover now uh, before we get into Kubernetes is just a kind of brief overview of containers. For any of you who are not actually familiar with containers, uh, this will help you provide, or at least provide a context uh, for when we get to Kubernetes itself. Because containers are the backbone of everything here, uh, and we're going to be talking about specifically Docker containers. And uh, what are containers? The first, we need to go back in history, we need to look at uh, the way we used to do things. This is back in the old days. Uh, we still do this today, to be honest, but uh, we maybe don't do it as much as we used to. In the old days, we used to have shared machines, uh, machines that would be uh, have an operating system installed. Uh, they would run multiple applications. Uh, they would have libraries that were installed either via the operating system or via uh, packages, uh, things like OpenSSL. And applications would sit on top of these and run. Uh, many of you would probably have experienced a situation where you had this kind of configuration where you were running multiple applications. And one application, maybe one that's not particularly important, uh, the running of that application affected the running of the other applications. Maybe you took the entire machine down, crashed it, or, or consumed all of the resources, consumed all of the CPU or the memory. So we have very little isolation within this setup. Uh, one application can easily compromise the running of all of the others. We also have no namespacing. Uh, each of the applications uh, has exactly the same view of the system. Uh, they see the same uh, process IDs, the same process table, the same users, the same file system, the same networking, the same everything. They share common libraries, uh, and that's kind of problematic as well, because often you make it in a situation where you update a library uh, in order to run a different application, uh, and the updating of that library affects the running of another application. Maybe the application breaks completely because it doesn't support that version of the library. Uh, and also, we still have this high, high coupling between applications and the operating system itself. So, next we had virtual machines. Uh, so, virtual machines effectively provide a layer on top of the hardware that provides an idealized piece of hardware, something that looks like hardware to running systems, but isn't actually the hardware itself. This allows us to run multiple copies of an operating system uh, on top of the uh, what's called a hypervisor, this idealized layer. And so we can have multiple copies of the operating system, virtual machines effectively, and we can run individual applications on each virtual machine. So now we have some isolation. Uh, but it's pretty inefficient. If anybody who's actually stood up virtual machines, uh, many of them, uh, you'll know that you still had to effectively uh, install an entire operating system. Now this problem is being solved uh, and addressed quite a bit these days with smaller uh, footprint operating systems, but again, you still have to stand up the operating system. So it's inefficient in terms of the reuse of all of that stuff that we've installed, uh, and it takes much more time to set up, it's harder to manage, and we still have this problem where the application is still highly coupled to the guest operating system. So, moving on to containers. So containers uh, are the new way. So containers effectively provide uh, a layer on top of the operating system uh, instead of on top of the uh, hardware itself. So we have this notion of an idealized operating system. And on top of that, we can run very uh, lightweight containers uh, that can carry all of their dependencies with them. Uh, these are very stripped down versions of operating systems generally, uh, but they carry their libraries with them uh, and all of their dependencies and all of their environment. So now effectively we can run one application per container and get some levels of isolation, Oops, sorry, and get much more isolation than we've had before uh, with the previous uh, virtualization with uh, hypervisors and virtual machines, and also with uh, dedicated machines with non-bare metal. So now we have kernels, one, one, 
one installation of the operating system, the kernel itself, and we have multiple containers running on top of that, uh, on top of this idealized operating system. So we're going to give you an example from uh, using Docker, and uh, Docker is the uh, most popular container format. There are more, and we're moving towards standardization, which we'll mention uh, a little bit later. But for now, most people will be familiar with Docker. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, we're going to go for a quick demo uh, shortly. Uh, but this is the way it looks generally. So in this case, we have three containers. We want to run three components of our application in containers. One, MySQL. Two, Memcache. And three, a combination of PHP and Apache, which normally run together. <clears throat> it could potentially be possible for you to separate PHP and Apache and run them in separate containers, but for this, uh, for this demonstration, we're going to run them in the same container. So they have their own libraries. MySQL has a unique set of libraries that it requires to run. They're completely separated from the libraries that Memcache and PHP require. Uh, so we can run that all in one container. Uh, Memcache and PHP and Apache have some libraries that they share. So when we actually build these uh, running images, uh, what we call images, uh, to run Memcache and to run PHP with Apache, there are some libraries that we can share when we do the actual basic setup. Uh, and they also some shared libraries uh, that are common to both of them. So in this situation, we have shared libraries uh, during the installation process, so the actual creation of the image. And we have, during the running of it, these libraries all separated. Uh, so they have all of their dependencies uh, uh, in one place. And underneath this, we have a server and we have an operating system. Now, this could be a, a bare metal machine. It could be something like a laptop. It could be a virtual machine. It could be pretty much anything that can run an operating system. <clears throat> so this isn't limited to running on virtual machines at all. And on the very far right, you'll see we have Docker. Now, this is the Docker engine. The Docker engine is responsible for ensuring or for creating the containers initially and then for maintaining their state. Uh, so Docker does all of the hard work in terms of making these containers run and making them available to users who want to consume uh, the services that they offer. So why containers? <coughs> so there are many reasons. Uh, the key reasons listed here are performance. They're much easier to spin up and to spin down as well. So we can actually bring these containers up very rapidly. Uh, so we need more of them. We can bring them up very quickly to uh, scale. Uh, and repeatability. So I think this is one of the most popular uses of Docker containers currently, uh, where we have the notion of uh, a consistent environment across both development, uh, QA, and production. So with a container, with its containerized environment, where the application has all of its dependencies uh, uh, bundled together, it's very easy to have a re repeatable or repeatability running of the application. So when we run it in QA, when we run it, run it in test, it will run exactly the same as it will in production. That's not completely guaranteed, but it is pretty much uh, fundamental to the way Docker works, uh, that the environment is always the same regardless of where you run it. Also, quality of service. These things are smaller. We can uh, allocate resources to them deterministically. Uh, through uh, Linux kernel offerings such as C groups and namespaces, we can actually control uh, the container's view of the system and also contain the amount of res uh, control the amount of resources uh, that it can consume. Uh, that in terms of uh, CPU, in terms of memory, and other things ultimately in the future. So we can effectively say we want this uh, one application to have only X amount of RAM and X amount of CPU, and then we can isolate them, isolate them from each other in terms of resources. Uh, accounting, these things are much smaller, much easier to manage, they're easier to track, uh, very easy to uh, bring all the login together in one place, and also they're extremely portable. So what we can run on a laptop, we can easily run on a virtual machine in production, uh, so we can move these things around very easily. Uh, and ultimately, uh, containers give us a fundamentally different way of managing our applications in the future. Okay, so we're going to go into a demo now, and I'm going to switch over to my video here. I recorded this earlier, so this isn't live, but it's close to live. Uh, but it does mean you won't get to see me making any mistakes or having to put up with my terrible typing. Uh, so it's better for us all if we uh, watch the video instead. But I will talk over the video uh, as we play it. So hopefully you can all see that. And the first thing we're going to look at is the Google Developers Console. So we, we're 
talking about running uh, a virtual machine here to do some testing with Docker as opposed to running on a laptop. So we're going to connect to a virtual machine, uh, running on Google Cloud Platform, uh, but it could be anywhere, right? It could be uh, on Amazon, Amazon, it could be on a laptop, it could be anywhere. So in this case, we've chosen to use Google Cloud Platform for obvious reasons, uh, and we're going to the Google Developers Console. Uh, we select Compute, we select Compute Engine, and we drill down into VM instances. So the Developers Console effectively gives us uh, access to all of the power of Google Cloud Platform. Uh, things like Compute, App Engine, Compute Engine, all of our storage services, all of our big data services, <coughs> and also Container Engine, which we'll look at later. Uh, this view shows us the virtual machines that are running within this particular project, a project called Kubernetes. And as we scroll down, we can see uh, an instance that I created specifically for this demo called Docker Demo. We can SSH into that directly from the browser. And it does time out initially, uh, but I didn't want to record the whole thing again just to get past the timeout, but it will connect almost immediately. <coughs> and there we are, we're connected to this running virtual machine in Google Cloud Platform. And this is running CoreOS, which is good because CoreOS actually offers us uh, the ability to run Docker straight out of the box. Uh, so CoreOS effectively is a platform for running uh, Docker containers, and these days other versions of containers called Rocket. So we can look at what containers are running on the system currently. In this case, we do Docker PS, and it will say there's no containers running. Now we can check to see if any containers are available. There are no containers at all. So Docker PS minus A will show all of them. So now go back to the console. And this is the Docker Hub. So this is the place where images that are used to create containers are uh, uploaded to. So this is a public registry, uh, but it also can be uh, made private for your own specific account. I've not logged in, so I'm only seeing the images that are available to everyone publicly. Uh, but if I had my own account, well, I do have my own account, I would see my images, images that I'd uploaded and which were private to me. Well, I could share them publicly if I wanted to, but they could be private to me. So in this case, we're interested in having images uh, for building a MySQL container, for building a memcache container, and for building a PHP application uh, within a container. So we can search for MySQL, and we can see we have a couple of options here. Search for memcache, and we have some more options here. And finally, we search for PHP, and we can see uh, several options here. If we go back to our running virtual machine, and we type docker images, we will see a list of all of the images that are installed on this machine currently, on this virtual machine currently. So these have been pulled down from the uh, public repository, <coughs> and they're locally cached at the moment. So we clear this, we can actually create some containers. So the first thing we can do is do a docker run on the MySQL image. Uh, we're going to call it uh, memcache, oh sorry, my, uh, memcache the image. We're going to call it memcache D. We're going to say, make this a daemon. I want it to run in the background, uh, and not in the foreground, and use the image called memcached. And now we can see that the uh, container is running. We have a, a memcached container. And next thing to do is to do the same thing with um, MySQL. MySQL is a little bit different, uh, fairly similar. We start the same, uh, minus minus name MySQL, minus D to docker to demonize. But we also have to pass in some uh, environment variables as well. So in this case, we specify a minus E uh, for an environment variable. And now we can specify the MySQL root password environment variable. And we're going to set that to be sausage. And this is the password I always use. All my accounts have uh, sausage as the password. So if you want to hack me, you can probably try that one. So now we have the MySQL container running as well. Docker PS will show both MySQL and memcached are running. Uh, so the last thing to do is to build our PHP application. So this is a little bit different in that we uh, we don't just want to run somebody's image. Uh, MySQL is fine. We can put our own tables and our own databases onto MySQL. Memcache, just the service we want to run. But for PHP, we want to run an application. Uh, so in that case, we need a base container, uh, and we need to effectively build our own uh, 
uh, image that we can run in a container. Uh, so the first thing I'm actually going to do here is connect to the MySQL instance uh, just to see what's happening with that the MySQL container. Uh, so we connect to the MySQL container. So this syntax uh, allows us to effectively ex execute a command within inside the container, within the context of the container. So in this case, we're saying uh, Docker exec, exec the name of the container, bash, and minus it effectively allows us to see what we're doing while we're in there. <coughs> so carry on doing that. We can uh, run the MySQL command, pass in a user, uh, pass in the minus p flag, and connect to it with the password, which was sausage, remember that. And there we are, we're inside MySQL. So this is running inside a container. Show databases shows what you have, just the sound of MySQL databases. We exit from there. And now, we're interested in PHP. So PHP, we have some files uh, on the uh, machine already installed, uh, already uh, uploaded. We have the standard setup.php file for setting up the database. We have a PHP ini file, which we'll use to configure our PHP setup. Uh, we have an index.php file, which is most of our source code. Now, uh, and we have an index.html file and a controllers.js file for our front end component. And we also have a Docker file. Uh, so let's quickly look at the uh, Docker file and what that offers. Come on, Mandy, type faster. So there we are. This is the Docker file. Uh, we say a base image uh, is PHP via Apache. So this is an, a, a, an image that's already built and is in the public repository. We're also going to run some commands. We're going to uh, update the operating system on the container uh, using app get update. And then we're going to install some packages, and then we're also going to install a packle, and then we're going to also do some uh, Docker stuff to set up PDO, uh, which is the way the PHP application will communicate to MySQL. The last steps are effectively to add uh, each of our files one by one. So we have a setup.php, index.php, all the way through to the php.init. So they are all steps, they're effectively all layers uh, that we're going to use to create this uh, image for our application. So now we run a build command. Uh, let's clear this, and we run Docker build. Provide a tag for it. We call it PHP guestbook, and we're going to use the files in the current directory. So this is where the Docker file is located. So this basically pulls down the necessary images, and again, remember this is layers. Uh, so this is going to be pulling down particular layers uh, and chunks of different images, and it takes a little while. Some of these are cached already. And ultimately, the images are down, and now we can start running the uh, next steps within the Docker file, uh, the app get update, <clears throat> and that's, what it, that's what's happening here. And then we're starting to do uh, the rest of the stuff. Uh, we're still actually doing the update. Now we're still we're now installing the actual packages, uh, the additional packages we we're interested in. And now we're adding the files: uh, setup.php, index.php, controllers.js, index.html, and finally the php.ini file. So that's done. So now we have uh, a container image. And if we do Docker images, you will see that we now have our PHP guestbook image. So the final step is to uh, do a Docker run on that image to create a container from it. So again, this is very similar to what we've run before for the memcache and MySQL containers. Uh, we're going to provide a name, PHP guestbook. We're going to demonize it, minus D, and pass in the image, which is PHP guestbook. And the final thing to do is to expose the, well, the final two things to do are, one, to expose the port. And for this, we use the minus P uh, flag with a port number and another port number. This is mapping port 80 on the container to port 80 on the host. And then we have to effectively link our containers together. And we do this using minus minus link. So we're going to say, we want you. We want this container to know MySQL, the MySQL container, as MySQL, effectively as a host. 
and same with memcache. We want that to be seen as memcached in the uh, run-in container. So now we run that. Let's resize so you can see the whole thing. <coughs> run that command. And we now have another container running. So now we should have three containers running. We docker ps and we have the three containers running. That's good. So the next thing to do is <coughs> uh, connect to the PHP uh, guestbook container. Same way we connected to the MySQL container. Uh, we're going to run bash inside that container. And now we can connect to, well, no, now we can ping the MySQL instance and ping the memcache D, oh, sorry, the MySQL container and ping the memcache D container. So as you can see, they appear as hosts within the Docker container itself. And we can actually cat the slash etc host file to so actually see those entries in, in that host file. And that was all created from the minus minus link options we passed in when we did the uh, run. So it just sees them as other hosts and can connect to them uh, as it would do normally. So uh, the last thing to do is actually test the application and make sure it works. And because this is a video, it should work. Nothing unexpected, hopefully. So we need the IP address, uh, which is the external IP address of that machine. We've opened up firewalls and such like already. These, by default, are not open. You would have to open them manually. Uh, because this is just a Docker demo. We didn't want to actually have to worry about that. So the first thing to do is initialize the database. And the setup.php does that for us. Creates the guestbook uh, database. Then we connect to the front end, which is index.html and we can type in some messages. My typing is bad even on videos. There you go, and that's done. And the final thing to do for our uh, demo, for this containers demo, is to connect to the MySQL instance and see what happened. And we do this using the uh, exec command, the docker exec command as we did before. Let's find the container, saying we want to run bash, and now we can just connect to MySQL as we did before. But we should see something more interesting this time. We specify the database this time, which is guestbook. Enter the password, which was sausage, I hear you say. And now we can select or show tables and then select the data from that table. Yay, so hello world. Okay, so that's it. So we've effectively created a guestbook application. Uh, it wasn't that difficult. It wasn't as easy as it could be either. either. Uh, so maybe we can make that easier with Kubernetes, uh, which is what we're going to get into next. So I'm going to just pause that and go back to my slides. And clicking on the tabs in the uh, video, which is not a good idea. Okay, so go back to the slides. So Kubernetes. Uh, at this point, I would normally ask how many people have heard of Kubernetes and how many people can actually pronounce it. Uh, if you do want lessons on how to pronounce Kubernetes, uh, please feel free to tweet me and I will try to help. So Kubernetes is uh, a Greek word. Uh, it means helmsman. <coughs> uh, it's the Greek word for helmsman. And it's also the root of the word governor, which I kind of find it more interesting uh, because in terms of what Kubernetes does, it's very much a governor of a group of containers. Uh, so its main role in life is to orchestrate uh, Docker containers. Uh, it can also provide provision clusters for you as well. Uh, so uh, you may rely on other services to provide cluster, uh, the cluster for you, but it can also be used to create clusters uh, if you need it to. Uh, it supports multiple cloud environments. Uh, you can run this on Amazon, you can run this on Azure, you can run it on uh, Google, you can run it on uh, <coughs> on pretty much any any, any uh, cloud provider. Uh, it's also supported by uh, companies like Cloud at <coughs> CoreOS, uh, Red Hat, uh, and also Mesosphere. And going back to what we looked at earlier with Borg, Kubernetes is effectively inspired and informed by everything that we've done in the past, uh, by all of our own experiences and by our internal systems. Our expectation is hopefully that Kubernetes will be better than Borg. Uh, it hasn't been built up 
bit by bit, uh, we understand what things were missing from Borg when we started out, what things are hard to change now, so we're trying to fix them straight from the get-go. <clears throat> so Kubernetes is open source and it's written the Go programming language. And the ultimate ethos of Kubernetes is to be able to manage applications, not have to worry about managing machines. So the first thing is to kind of prime you with some uh, concepts, and we have many concepts we need to get through. Some of them are fairly straightforward. We've already looked at the container. Uh, we kind of know what a service is. Maybe we need to understand better what that means within Kubernetes. A volume, a volume is fairly obvious. Uh, a, a node is, again, fairly obvious. It's a node within a cluster. Replication controller probably doesn't mean much to you too, and how do we use labels? So we're gonna get into those concepts. So the first thing is the actual cluster itself. And I've mentioned that clusters come in many different forms within Kubernetes. Uh, we can just do a, a kube up to create a cluster uh, and install Kubernetes on all the machines within the cluster. Uh, or we can rely on something like Mesos <coughs> uh, or some other underlying network infrastructure to provide that fabric of machines for us. But ultimately, a cluster looks kind of similar to what we had with Borg earlier. We have a master uh, that has a scheduler and we have nodes, and nodes have kubelets instead of borglets. So each node in the cluster will have its kubelet that is responsible for maintaining the running state of our cluster, the actual containers within our cluster. Uh, we also have this concept of rep replication controller and also the proxy which is responsible for uh, exposing our running containers as services. So Options in terms of clusters uh, are something like this. We can go from pretty much anything. Uh, you can use Vagrant to spin up a cluster of machines on your laptop. Uh, <coughs> that's fairly easy to do. Uh, you can use a multi-node cluster from a cloud provider. Uh, it can be hosted uh, or you can manage it yourself. Uh, Google provide Google Container Engine uh, as a hosted offering. Uh, you can run it on-premise on bare metal machines as well. Uh, you can run it on cloud, on virtual machines. So there are many, many options you can use in terms of uh, many, many options in terms of creating your cluster on which Kubernetes will schedule uh, your containers for you. <clears throat> and at the bottom there, you'll find a link to the Kubernetes cluster matrix. So we talked about containers. Uh, we need to get one concept out of the way, which is a concept of pods. Uh, pods are a little bit harder to get your head around, uh, but for now, just imagine them as being an enabler for running containers uh, within Kubernetes. So these are the things that we schedule. Uh, <coughs> we have a container and a volume, in this case, uh, within inside a pod. We can schedule these things within our cluster, uh, within the fabric of machines that we have created uh, as a cluster. Uh, so in this case, we have uh, a one-to-one -one mapping of a container to a pod. It has its own volume. It's a web server with a volume that makes the a huge amount of sense. Web servers have to uh, have to serve data, so they need somewhere from which to serve it from uh, to the con uh, to the consumers that want to access that uh, the applications running on it. So we use a pod to schedule containers effectively, uh, and the pod effectively acts like a logical host. Uh, so where you would stand up an Apache bare metal machine, uh, you may just stand up a pod with a container within it. Uh, and these pods are effectively ephemeral. Uh, some people use the analogy, uh, they are like cattle, they can be easily replaced. Unlike pets, uh, like your servers, and the machines you have uh, next to your desk or your workstation, which you give names to, uh, these things are like cattle. Uh, but I prefer the analogy where we have crops and flowers, where crops are replaceable in the same way as cattle are, or you can have flowers which you give names and water. So these things can uh, easily die and they can be replaced very easily uh, by something that's exactly the same. Uh, single container pods can also be created directly from a container image. Uh, so you don't actually have to create a pod itself. You can just say, uh, I want you to run this container for me from this image uh, and Kubernetes will do the background creation of the pod for you. Uh, so you don't actually have to worry about creating it in that case. Uh, but pods do have uses beyond running single containers. And that looks something like this, where we have a pod here running two containers side by side with a volume that's shared between the two containers themselves. So in this case, uh, <coughs> a pod is effectively a grouping of containers uh, and shared volumes. The containers are tightly coupled. Uh, they can make IPC calls to each other. Uh, they also have a shared namespace. They have the same notion of what the network is and what the ports are. 
uh, and again neuroephemeral as well, and they can live and die together. And this makes a huge amount of sense for containers uh, that you would normally run, or applications that are containerized, that would normally run on the same logical host uh, next to each other. Uh, in this case, the example we have in the diagram is uh, a Node.js application in a container uh, that's servicing consumers, uh, servicing requests, and we have something that's acting as a Git synchronizer uh, that's synchronizing with uh, a repository or a project on GitHub, and Whenever that GitHub project is updated, the Git synchronizer will pull down changes and write them to the volume. And that would effectively update the data that's being served by the Node.js application container. So it makes sense for these to live together. Uh, they share the volume. Uh, the Git synchronizer writes to the volume. The Node.js application container serves from the volume. <coughs> we have a few more examples as well. So the pattern where we have uh, cooperative applications or cooperative containers uh, like this is called a sidecar pattern. So the synchronization, the, the Git synchronizer effectively looks like a sidecar where the Node.js application is effectively the motorbike. The motorbike and sidecar makes a huge amount of sense. That's called the sidecar pattern. <coughs> then the ambassador, ambassador pattern where we have <coughs> a PHP application in this case, some container uh, that needs to talk to another service. Uh, but in this case, we're actually proxying that service. So we're simplifying the process by which the PHP application run in the container uh, will talk to Redis in this case. Uh, so we can just make one uh, call out to the proxy, uh, both reads and writes, and the Redis proxy will take care of uh, making sure that that gets pushed out to the appropriate service. Uh, uh, it could be a master or a Redis worker. <clears throat> so that's what the ambassador pro uh, pattern looks like. And also we have the adapter pattern. And that effectively allows us to uh, connect, a, uh, connect two containers together, whereby the second container adapts the output of the first one. In this case, we'll be using it for monitoring. So we have a Redis container, uh, and we have this thing called a Redis exporter. The monitoring system that we have on our system uh, could be anything. It could be Google Cloud monitoring. Uh, it could be uh, some other monitoring system. And that's effectively connecting to the Redis exporter, and that is effectively connecting to Redis. So the Redis exporter is effectively adapting the output from Redis in terms of monitoring to the input needed to our monitoring system. So that's the adapter pattern. So let's talk uh, briefly about volumes. Uh, volumes are obviously a fairly straightforward concept. And we've looked at a couple of examples already. Uh, the volumes are bound to a pod that encloses it, so they live inside a pod. Uh, so they are pod-based volumes as opposed to being things that exist on disk, although they can map to things that exist on disk. Effectively, to running containers, they look like directories. And effectively, what they are and what they're backed by is determined by their volume type. And we have many volume type options. The first one is the empty directory. This effectively lives with the pod. It's created with the pod, and it lives with the pod. And the two containers, in this case, that are running within the pod will write and read data to that volume. But when the pod goes away, the data on the volume goes away as well. So this is not persistent. So effectively, it's scratch space that's shared between the two pods while they're running. It doesn't exist outside of that. Another option is, to, uh, is the, hello, the host path option. And the host path option allows us to map a volume, again, which looks like a directory, uh, to the running containers. Uh, allow that to map that to uh, some path on our node's uh, actual file system. So we're mapping something within the container, so some component of the file system on the underlying, uh, underlying node that the pod is running on. Uh, so this isn't always a really great idea, uh, because it may be possible that the actual node itself, its file system, and the things that are ultimately being mapped into the container may be different from one node to another. Uh, so we have some kind of uh, dependencies here that might creep in and may change the way things run uh, from one node to another. So we have to be very careful when we use those. The next thing is, uh, I don't know why we have had this, sorry. Uh, <coughs> the next thing is NFS. And this effectively allows us to map NFS mounts into our containers, and also with uh, similar services such as ClusterFS as well. And finally, the last one, I have to go through this again, obviously did this wrong. We have uh, 
cloud provider block storage. So in this case, the volume within the pod would map to uh, some block storage provided by the cloud provider. Uh, so this could be GC persistent disk or AWS block storage currently. Uh, so we could be effectively mapping onto a persistent disk within Google Cloud Platform or to a EBS volume uh, in uh, Amazon. So that's how volumes work. Labels, another concept that might be a little bit outlandish at first. Uh, so everything in Kubernetes can have a label. Uh, and we can actually talk to the API and say, give me things with these labels. Give me pods with these labels. Give me uh, services with these labels. Anything that has a label can be retrieved by the API. <clears throat> so in this case, what we're saying is uh, uh, we have labels. We have a label called type equals FE. Uh, as you can see, labels are key value pairs. So we have type equals FE. This is completely arbitrary, arbitrary metadata that has semantic meaning to you uh, or to your running applications, uh, but it doesn't have any meaning within the context of Kubernetes itself. Uh, so in this case, type equals FE means we're saying this has a type equals front end, and that's meaningful to us, not necessarily to Kubernetes. So this is the only grouping mechanism within Kubernetes. This is the way we group things, uh, and we look at that when we look at replication controllers and services uh, coming up. So we have another example of a label here. Uh, we have a pod with a version equals v2 label. So now we can build dashboard applications. And the dashboard application here on the left could say, I care about pods with type equals FE. So I'm going to create a selector, and I'm going to select on that. So when I make API calls, you're going to give me the pods back that have that label. And I can display the state of them, uh, whatever the dashboard application does. And same with the one on the right, that cares about pods that have a label version equals v2. And next we have replication controllers, and replication controllers effectively control the life cycle of pods. Uh, so this would go back to similar to what we had with Google and with our engineers and our, our software engineers wanting to be able to say, I want to have X number of these, I want to have these resources assigned to these uh, tasks. Uh, the replication controller effectively handles that for us. It's what we call desired state. You say, I have a pod that has a label, version equals v1, and I'm going to want to have two of them. Uh, we have a template uh, that defines what the uh, pod looks like and how it's created. We pass that to the replication controller. We say we want two of these, and the replication controller will go ahead and uh, create the pods for us. Uh, so as soon as we create the replication controller, it says, I should have two pods running. It will find there are no pods running, so it will go ahead and create them for us using the template we provided. Uh, so in this case, we have two replication controllers, one for pods equals version equals v1, and one for pods where version equals v2. Uh, so these are labels, uh, and again, replication controllers using the grouping mechanism of labels uh, to determine its constituency. So in this case, replication controller on the right-hand side only has one. This could be used for a canary system where we're rolling out uh, different versions of our application, and we have a full slide uh, showing that uh, coming up shortly. So a replication control is effectively a canonical example of a control loop, something that monitors the state of our running pods to make sure that we have the required number at any given time. So in this case, we have an example where we're saying, this replication controller, this is the pod template, we want to have four of these, and the replication controller's job is to make sure there are always four of those running. So in this case, the first example, it checks to see it's free. Uh, that's not enough. We need to start with more. Now we have four. Now we continuously check. We have four. We have four. Maybe at some point we have five for some reason. Uh, maybe uh, there was some kind of split brain on the cluster and <clears throat> something joined back, and now we have five. And in that case, it would remove one to make sure we only have four again. So it uses the template to uh, create new pods uh, on the fly uh, and make sure that we have the desired number of uh, replicas at any given time. Uh, also, contained aliveness. So, when we mentioned here about the replication controller actually checking to make sure the right number are running, what does that actually mean? So, basically, we have to have the notion of liveness. Uh, is a container within like, a pod running? Uh, and the way that Kubernetes checks this uh, by default is at the process level. The Kubernetes will check with Docker. So the container that's running within inside that pod is actually running. So that's the process level. But at the application level, we can also have user-defined health checks. So in this case, the user will define their notion of what a live container is. 
And these could be HTTP health checks where the Kubelet effectively calls a webhook, uh, some uh, uh, URL. Uh, container exec where the Kubelet will run or ask Docker to run a command in a container. And <coughs> uh, next thing is TCP socket. Uh, in this case, the Kubelet will attempt to open a socket to the container. So that's how we determine liveness within this system. And the final one we want to look at is services. So services are effectively a group of pods that act as one. Uh, they make a service. And these groupings are, again, done by a selector <coughs> on labels. So the pods will have a label. In this case, we don't have that in the example. We have that coming up. Uh, so these pods will all have a label uh, that the uh, service itself will select on. And that will be the constituency of that service. When you create a service, you effectively get a virtual IP address, uh, and you also get a DNS name. <coughs> For some circumstances, which we'll look at shortly, uh, you'll also get a load balanced IP address on the external, uh, the external cloud provider itself. So <coughs> the virtual IP address is effectively uh, captured by the cube proxy, the proxy we looked at on the cluster that was running earlier. Uh, we haven't really gone into any detail of that, but effectively that is what maintains the constituency of the service. It knows where the pods are running within the cluster. We could have three pods within our service and a thousand nodes, <clears throat> and it's the job of the queue proxy to work together to understand where the actual pods are running. So that when we make a request, when a client makes a request into the uh, service, it will be routed to a pod running on one of the nodes. <coughs> So effectively, this hides complexity, and this is ideal for non-native applications. Here's a canary example. Uh, kind of mentioned this earlier. This looks similar to our replication controller layout that we had earlier. Well, we have three pods, uh, but we have two replication controllers. Uh, replication controller one maintains pods with version equals v1, and replication controller two on the right maintains pods with version equals v2. Uh, so in one case, we have one pod. In the other case, we have two pods. The pods also have a type equals FE label as well. <clears throat> and this is the constituency of the service, because the service is made up of pods with type equals FE. And so effectively, we have three, uh, two different types of pods running that make up this service. One is our old version V1, and one is our, uh, sorry, two are our old version V1, and one is our new version V2. Uh, so effectively, what we're doing here is saying some portion of our uh, incoming requests will be routed to our new version, uh, and many will be routed to our old version. And we can then do some uh, canary-like uh, testing, A-B type testing, uh, to see if the updated version of the application is running correctly. So that's a canary example. So how does all this map uh, to our application that we had originally? Uh, so we have our client application, we have our Python front ends, MySQL and Memcached, uh, and our maps like this. We have MySQL, we have a, a pod and a volume, uh, and that's exposed as a service. And we have memcached, which is also a pod, uh, so we lost the D there, and is exposed by a service. These will be consumed by the Python uh, pods. Uh, we'll have multiple pods running Python, and this will be managed by uh, a replication controller, which is the icon in the bottom left-hand corner. This is exposed as a service uh, with an external IP address, in this case, to our clients. So effectively, the Python uh, pods talk to MySQL via a service and talk to Memcache via a service. And client applications or client uh, users uh, talk to our Python front ends via a service as well. <coughs> so in terms of the developer view, going back to what we looked at for Borg, that looks something like this. We have to write a replication controller. We will create a configuration file, and we'll look at this shortly. Uh, and we give it a name. In this case, we call it PHP Guestbook. We specify the image. In this case, this is a container image, uh, PHP Guestbook uh, EuroPython in this case. And <coughs> you'll see why it's EuroPython shortly. Uh, then we have to specify the resources. Uh, so we can say memory equals 128 megabytes. Uh, we want to have half a CPU, uh, and Kubernetes has its own notion of what a CPU core is. Uh, so in this case, we're saying 500 M's, which effectively represents half a CPU core. And we can specify ports. Uh, we want to uh, expose this on port 80, and we want one of them. Or maybe we can say we want 10,000 of them. Uh, so that's 
the job of the replication controller to make sure we have 10,000 running at any given time. So this looks extremely similar to what we had with Borg, but it is on Kubernetes. When it comes to scheduling, scheduling currently is fairly uh, basic uh, within Kubernetes. Uh, we have much more advanced scheduling within Borg, but ultimately this will catch up and we'll have very similar capabilities. So currently uh, we predicate our scheduling based on pod selection on its labels, uh, which labels we should select, and also on node capacity. Uh, so based on the actual re requested resource limits within the uh, file that we saw on the previous slide, we will determine whether nodes have the actual capacity to be able to run a pod. And if multiple nodes are capable of running a pod, we will select the one that has the uh, least amount of consumption of resources. So whose pods that are running currently on that uh, node consume the least amount of resources. So in the future, we will be have, able to have resource-aware scheduling, where we can do much more, uh, much more intelligent scheduling in terms of being efficient when it comes to utilizing CPU and memory. So the next thing is to do a demo, demonstration of a visualization of what all this looks like and what all these concepts mean. So finally, we're just going to quickly wrap up with this one, uh, and I'm going to show you the rest of the video. So we're going to, we've got a cluster. Uh, this is a cluster we created earlier. I'm actually creating the cluster here, <coughs> uh, calling it Webinar Cluster. I'm going to specify a cluster size of three. And click create, and that's going to go off and create the cluster for us. <clears throat> that all happens very quickly on the video uh, because it's a video, <laughs> and we can cut those bits out. Uh, it doesn't take too long to spin up generally, uh, but sitting there waiting for a couple of minutes for it to spin up is not the best thing to do on a webinar. So now we have a cluster, uh, and we can click on that and see information about the cluster. <clears throat> okay. So next thing we're going to look at configuration files. So we kind of looked at these already uh, on the slides, but this is the configuration file for our MySQL pod. Uh, and we're saying we want one CPU for this MySQL pod. Uh, the image is MySQL 5.6. We're specifying the MySQL root password as an environment variable. And we're also mapping it to uh, persistent disk storage. So this is a MySQL uh, pod with a uh, volume that's backed by persistent disk. And we're showing the disk here in Google Cloud Platform in the uh, Developers Console. So this is the actual disk that backs that volume, 500 gigabytes in size. The next one we want to look at is the actual service itself. So this is the service configuration file. Uh, we can see the service there. And we can see uh, MySQL is the uh, name of the pod, <coughs> name of the selector that it's using uh, to select the pods. And then we can spin those up and actually make them run. And this, we go to the command line, we use a command called kubectl to actually start our pods. <clears throat> so in this case, we just say create minus F and the path to our configuration file. And then we do the same for the service. and that will create the service for us. And we can see this visualized. So <clears throat> the visualization uh, is actually talking to the API behind uh, the scenes uh, to actually say, show me all of the pods we have. And in this case, it gets the pods, it sees MySQL and it displays it on the screen. Show me all of the services you have. It gets all of the services and displays the MySQL service. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit now because we're running out of time. Uh, so I'm going to go to this situation where we have created a front end so this is the front-end service. This is the actual PHP component of the application. Uh, and we're going to specify load balancer here. This means create an external load balancer. So uh, this will effectively expose the running PHP uh, pods uh, to external clients. So the next thing we need to do is to create that front-end service. Now we have the front-end service. 
at the moment you can only see the IP address for its external IP, uh, but soon you'll see uh, its external IP as well. But before that, we're going to jump back to the uh, configuration files, look at the configuration file for the controller, for the replication controller. Here we see replication controller, uh, various parameters. Uh, we want two replicas in this case, so we want two pods. And there we have the template that we use for creating pods. And down below it has a spec for containers and the image we want to use. In this case, the image is hosted within Google Cloud Platform. And there's the external IP address uh, that will be used by clients to connect to the running service. Now we do kubectl create minus f front end, and this is called rcv1 YAML. And that will create our pods, well, it creates the replication controller, which sees that there are no pods running, and will create the pods for us. So now we have the front end controller, and we have the front end pods running as well. These are all wired together, uh, and as you can see these arrows, uh, they represent the wiring together to the other services. And now we're going to scale, we're going to uh, go up from two pods uh, to two replicas to four replicas. Uh, so we have a very simple command, kubectl scale rc, the name of the replication controller and the number of replica replicas we want. And now we have four. <clears throat> so now we can scale that. They are all constituents of the service, so the service will now start load balancing requests across all four of those nodes, uh, all four of those pods. Uh, and these are running on different nodes within the cluster. Now we scale down to one, and we'll scale back up to three for the last part of the demo. So for the last part of the demo, oh, first we're going to connect to the actual uh, app running application to make sure it works. We run the setup.php like we did before uh, for the containers version. Then we run index.html. And we can see, ah, okay, this is the guestbook. This is the Euro Python guestbook. This is what I gave last week. And I've even spelt Bill Bauer wrong, which is not very good. Uh, so this is broken. This is not the right uh, uh, guestbook application we should be running. We need to run the updated version. And we already have that created. Uh, so how do we roll out a new version of our application? So again, that's going to be fairly straightforward. And we go back to the visualization. Now, first, we look at our new uh, replication controller configuration. Uh, that's the old one, this is the new one, replication controller, and this is version two. Uh, so we're using version two labels everywhere. And we have a new image. Uh, this is the eSYN-web version of the image. And we want to have three replicas, because we have three running currently. And so now we can go back and do a rolling update on the uh, running configuration that we have currently. So we do kubectl, rolling update. We specify the name of the uh, replication controller we want to update, and the name of the file we're going to update it from. So now we watch what happens. First, a new replication controller is created, uh, and it creates a v2 pod, and then it removes a v1 pod. So we always have the right amount of pods running, or more than the right amount. We never have less than what we need. So now we've created a second one, a second 2.0 pod. Now we remove one of the 1.0 pods to get back to three, and finally we remove or create another front end 2.0 pod and remove the last 1.0 pod. So now the last thing to do is actually remove the old front end that controller. And that's gone, and that's it. So now we've done the update, so a new version of the application. Uh, we should be able to go back to the application now and check that things have been updated. There you go, the Synergy Webinar 2015 Guestbook, and that was just rolled out uh, on demand. If anything went wrong at this point, we could roll back to our previous configuration, or if anything went wrong during the actual update itself, maybe we're doing this over a period of time, we could actually roll back the entire thing. And there you go. And that's it for the demo. I'm not going to go through the last part because we don't have time. And I'm just going to wrap up in the slides. So 
So this is how we visualized it. Uh, it's all wired together using a proxy, a uh, Kube CTL proxy uh, with a path to our uh, JavaScript static content files. Uh, it's all written in JS Plum, if you're interested. Uh, the state of the Kubernetes, uh, it was basically uh, announced at OSCON last week now, uh, Kubernetes 1.0, uh, so that's now at 1.0, which is great. It was open source just over a year ago, uh, and it's already won uh, several awards. It's extremely popular, about 9,500 stars on uh, GitHub. And Google have launched Google Container Engine, which is a hosted version of Kubernetes, and you can find that at cloud.google.com slash container engine. The roadmap or Kubernetes is available down link there. Uh, Container Engine is effectively managed Kubernetes, currently at Kubernetes v1, uh, and it effectively manages the uptime of the master for you. Uh, you don't have to worry about the master, uh, so we take care of that for you. So all you have to do is worry about the nodes. Uh, we, we effectively manage pushing out updates, uh, Kubernetes updates and operating system level updates, and we have the option to resize via managed instance groups. There is also centralized login and also support for Google Cloud VPN. Uh, you can create clusters using your Google Developers Console, as we've already seen. You can use Google Deployment Manager to create clusters, and you can also use HashiCorp Terraform. And it's also finally, I want to mention the Open Container Initiative, uh, which is effectively uh, bringing together various companies, including Docker, uh, to create a standard uh, on which we can all run our containers. So rather than having a fear of fragmentation, many different container formats, uh, the Open Container Initiative promised a, a specification on which we can all build different containers, uh, but with some commonalities that will allow us to run on any platform. So finally, uh, frequently asked questions, these will be in the slide deck, and Kubernetes is open source, so we need your help. Uh, you can go to kubernetes.io or to the GitHub project on Google Cloud Platform slash Kubernetes in GitHub. Uh, you can find us on IRC at hash Google containers or you can tweet us at kubernetes.io. And that's it. So I think we're pretty much out of time with that. Uh, Adele, are you there? Hi, Mandy. Yes, thank you. I, I believe that there has been some questions throughout. So um, perhaps if you can go through those if you have some time now. I can't see them. Uh, <laughs> where do I find them? Just on the um, questions pane. Ah, right, okay. It's very small. <laughs> <laughs> Can I resize it? Can I make it bigger? Uh, maybe that helps. I can like see one line, so I can't see much. Let's see if I, let's see if I can answer them. Uh, da right, okay. I'd love to be able to resize this window, but I can't. Ah, okay, let me click on it. How does the network work with containers, IP per container? Uh, no, we have an IP per pod, basically. So the actual uh, running pods have an IP address, uh, and the containers within them uh, work in the way Docker does. And that's all made possible by uh, uh, subnet masking uh, done within uh, the actual Google Cloud Platform itself. For doing it on uh, other cloud providers, you need other services in place, things like Flannel to make this work. So, if I can get to the next one. How big can this container become, and is there a limit on memory that can be assigned to the DB cache? Uh, so, again, we go back to resource uh, scheduling. So, a container uh, can be any size you like uh, in terms of resources, but generally you're probably going to want to limit the number of resources when you're scheduling on Kubernetes. So, I'm not quite sure this is a Docker question or a Kubernetes question, <clears throat> but generally if you want to run something like MySQL in a container, that's not a problem. Uh, but if you have a good feel for how much resource you need to be able to assign to a, a container in order to be able to run it on a pod in Kubernetes, then you should do that within your configuration file. <clears throat> so you may say, uh, this pod I expect to be able to use one CPU or X amount of memory. Uh, so you specify that yourself. <clears throat> but there's no real limits on how big a container can be. Obviously, if you want to have a, a pod that runs with more than one CPU core, but your nodes have only one CPU core, then that becomes more difficult. Uh, so I find the next question. Boom. <clears throat> so 
So high availability for Kubernetes master node, uh, scheduled our API server. <clears throat> so currently the recommendation for high availability for the Kubernetes master is to create multiple clusters. Uh, currently we don't have a HA offering for the Kubernetes master. Uh, although if you get a hosted service, uh, such as Google Container Engine, uh, we will manage the running of your master for you, uh, so we can guarantee that it won't go down. <clears throat> so that should make it high, highly available. Again, I don't know all of the details about what we do behind the scenes, uh, but uh, we do take care of running that master for you. Uh, so we take it completely out of your hands, <clears throat> and you won't even see it running in the Google uh, Cloud Console, uh, Developers Console. I see there's more questions. Can I balance pods in different Kubernetes environments? Can proxies federate sort of? Uh, not really. Uh, and I'm not even quite sure if that's a high level design goal ultimately. It's certainly definitely possible for you to do it yourself. Uh, but whether we'd actually be able to have multiple different Kubernetes environments clustered together. Uh, with us scheduling pods across different environments, say so we could have uh, some of our fleets of machines within Google Cloud Platform, maybe some within Azure. Uh, that would be interesting, uh, but um, it's not actually possible today. So, so my next question, I think that's it. I think there's no more questions. But feel free to tweet me if you have any more questions. Uh, my mouth's very dry at the moment. I'm struggling to uh, get my act together. So just tweet me any questions you have. Lovely. Thank you so much, Mandy, awesome. for Thank you. and for everyone that joined us today. And like we said, the slides and recording will be available um, tomorrow by email. And, and if anyone does have any further questions, then um, please do tweet Mandy, and, and she'll be able to take those questions. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Cheers, bye-bye.